proceedings. So we're going to hear from a number of speakers. Um, and uh, and uh, the first one is Dr. Nick Watts. He's the first speaker in this second session after afternoon coffee. Uh, because of the time difference, his presentation has been pre-recorded. Um, and um, well, Dr. Nick Watts is a medical doctor and he's NHS England's, the National Health Service in England's first chief sustainability officer. Nick works to engage the health profession on the links between climate change and public health. And he's had, uh, he's founded both the Global Climate and Health Alliance in the UK. Um, and um, uh, uh, he's re really uh, 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 someone who's had spent a lot of time thinking and about climate change and working in climate change. So could we share the slides, please, Caitlin? Uh, one moment, Jeffrey. Thank you, indeed. Hi, hello, my name is Nick Watts. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the NHS. I am here in London. I am so, so sorry, so sad not to be able to be with you. God, it's warmer, God, it's nicer where you are. It's cold here. We're here to talk about climate change. We're here to talk about what The Lancet has described as the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, what the World Health Organization has described Margaret Chan, 2008, go look it up, has described as the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. <laughs> Pretty strong words. Um, we're here to talk about the role of healthcare within that. And there's a bit of context before we kick off, before I start, I want to bear in mind, the time for talking about the problem is over. The time for talking about whether or not we should do anything about this is over. The time for talking about how fast we should go is over. This is an enormous threat to health systems around the world. No matter how fast we are sprinting to tackle climate change, we have been slow, we have been delayed by three decades, 30 years, we will always be too slow. You always need to go further. We always need to go faster. That is the mantra, is the approach we adopt here in the NHS. Never once do I ever get asked, Nick, should we be doing this? Or Nick, are you sure we want to be moving quite so fast? It is always, oh, 2023 is a really long way away. Are you sure we can't do it by January? Some important context to bear in mind. So I'm going to talk about the problem. I'm going to talk about why a healthcare system, why the National Health Service might care about climate change. I don't want to do that, and I don't often spend much of my time doing that, but I'm doing it safe in the knowledge, in the comfort of the knowledge, that everyone else who is talking throughout the rest of today is going to be talking about solutions. And make sure your questions are tangible. Make sure your questions are centered around not what can we do in 2025. They're centered around what can I do personally tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. This stuff has to become real. If it doesn't become real, we fall not three decades, but four decades behind. <clears throat> so there's three reasons. Three reasons why the NHS, why any healthcare system, let's be honest, should care about climate change. Three parts of this problem we've got to solve. Number one, it's big, it's scary. How big is it? Well, very roughly, we are adding energy up into the atmosphere, or we are adding uh, en energy roughly the same amount as six atomic bombs worth of energy released into the atmosphere every single second of every single hour, day, week, month, year, for decades and decades. That, at a planetary scale, has caused global average surface temperature to rise by 1.12 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's what the number was this morning. It's a huge shift in the amount of energy in a fixed system, right? That's effectively what we're talking about, increasing energy in a fixed system. That leads to increased basal rates and it leads to increased volatility. And that's what you see manifested. So if you're in the NHS, we're worried, we're deeply concerned about heat, we're worried about flood, we're worried about storm. 
If you're in Australia, you should be worried about heat as well, but you should also be worried about fire. You should be worried about smoke inhalation. You should be worried about all of those health effects that are often quite insidious, quite surreptitious, um, getting more and more frequent. I actually have just up there on a screen over there, a map overlooking the health facilities of the country. Overlaid with that is current and every five years going forward, flood risk, high level flood risk that we expect to experience. It gets pretty scary pretty damn quickly. In fact, if I go back 10 years, it's already got pretty scary. The NHS was founded with a core principle. We're very proud of this, right? One of the first, if the first healthcare system in the world to have a universal uh, commitment to universal health coverage. High quality care for all now and for future generations. It is in everything we do. It's on the letterhead, it's on the business card. High quality care for all now and for future generations. You cannot do that. The NHS cannot do that. It can't achieve its core purpose unless we respond to climate change. The heat, the flood, the spread of infectious disease, the threats are different depending on where you're coming from, but they get bigger and they get bigger and they reach positive tipping points. That's the first reason. We understand we're clever, we're good health professionals. We've looked at the science. We've studied it closely. We've studied it, it's taken us a little while, but we understand that the NHS needs to respond to climate change if we want to be able to deliver high quality care for our patients. Number two, we've actually had a decent crack at this about 10 years or so worth of work trying to respond to climate change. Initially, a small team of four or five people doing some really impressive work. Expanded now to where we are today, 140, a small army of health professionals responding across the country to the threat, threats of climate change. New net zero medicines teams, net zero estates teams, net zero nursing, allied health professionals, everyone starting to engage in part of that solution. But if I go back to those 10 years, over the last 10 years, we've learned some pretty important stuff. Number one, we have learned that the response to climate change, it is good, to, good for health. We have learned that we are reducing air pollution outside of our pediatric hospitals. We are reducing air pollution outside of uh, our social care facilities, outside of our aged care facilities. We have learned that we are investing in local infrastructure, healthcare systems acting as anchor institutions for their communities, reducing health inequalities, investing in local food, local agriculture. And we've learned that a sustainable healthcare system is one that engages beyond the four walls of its hospital or the four walls of its clinic and starts to ask questions about what a safe, what a healthy built environment around, around us is. That has saved lives. It has saved money, not a little bit of money, tens of millions of pounds. And it's been good for the environment. We've reduced our emissions by 30% over the last 10 years. It's something we're really quite proud of. We're also anxious because we've got to go a heck of a lot faster. And so going forward, uh, we announced back in October 2020, the NHS uh, is going to get to net zero, net zero by 2040 for the emissions we control directly, 2045 for our entire global international footprint. So the first reason is you can't deliver high quality care now and for future generations for everyone unless you respond to climate change. The second reason is we've realized that so many of the priorities in our long-term strategy and our long-term plan are so perfectly aligned with what you want to do to deliver better care, better value for your patients. Everywhere you look, you find those synergies everywhere. In fact, I actually think you have to try hard to not find those syn synergies. I hear a lot of people complain about them every now and then. I actually don't think they're there quite in the same uh, in the same volume as we might worry about, but fair enough, we should consider that seriously. The third reason is that we're a big part of this problem. <clears throat> so I talked about six atomic bombs, I talked about 1.12 degrees of global average temperature rise. The NHS, and it's worth holding our hands up here, we are a part of that problem. We are 5% of national emissions. The NHS, an organization of 1.4 million healthcare professionals, 120 billion pounds of spend. The emissions of our entire health service, roughly the same size as the entire country of Croatia, of Denmark. 
that's broadly mimicked. If you go and look around the world, there are a couple of studies that start to ask these sorts of questions in Australia, um, in Thailand, in the Philippines, in uh, France. Uh, I want to say Sweden, but maybe don't hold me to that. And in the United States, broadly you will see we all look the same. We all broadly, our healthcare systems look very similar. There are, across OECD countries, quite a lot of similarities. Um, a across the United States, slightly different. The emissions profile is actually slightly higher. But it varies from about 4% of national emissions to about 7% of national emissions. It's a big part of that problem. If you place that within the public sector, the NHS is 36%, 35.5% of uh, public sector emissions, 40% of public sector powered consumption, electricity consumption. We're a big part of the problem. And so we know because we're full of 1.4 million healthcare professionals that signed, pledged, shouted an oath, first do no harm. We know we have a responsibility to act and to respond. So I'm gonna stop there. Everyone else needs to talk about the solutions. They need to talk about the how, they need to talk about what we're gonna do tomorrow morning. The why, you can't do your job as a healthcare professional unless you respond to climate change. In fact, your job is enhanced by responding to climate change. And it turns out that this work, building, delivering, driving a more sustainable healthcare system is perfectly aligned with the oath that we all took at the start of our career, primum non nocere. Those are the three reasons why we're all here today, the three reasons why this problem matters. The one thing I wanna leave you with is you're not alone. A few weeks ago, uh, there was only one healthcare system in the world that had a net zero commitment, the NHS. We were really proud of it. What we are even more proud of is that at COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference up in Glasgow, we were no longer alone. 14 other healthcare systems made net zero commitments with targets, with plans, with angry action forward. So exciting. When we go out, and we did this at about the same time, we go out and we ask our uh, 1.4 million healthcare professionals around the country, hey, what do you care about? What do you want to see more of? Nine out of 10 of them, shout back at us. We want to see the NHS act in a more sustainable way. I want to work for an organization that is tackling climate change. Can't do your job without it. It enhances it and it aligns with the oath, but hey, you're not alone. So thank you very, very much. I'm very, very sorry I couldn't be there. I wish I could have been. Have a fantastic event.